this passage of scripture. It is John chapter number 11. Um, it is uh, the story of Lazarus. How many have heard the story of Lazarus? I don't want to take it for granted. You know, I know uh, for some of us, we may be a little new to church or you ain't been in church so long. You kind of mix up Lazarus and Nicodemus and, and, and Jesus and John and James. And it's no shame, you know, but um, I, I, I feel like uh, sometimes we rush through the reading of the text, but I, I don't want to do that today because this is a very seminal passage in the ministry of Jesus, in the work of Jesus, and it does inv invite us to think very powerfully about what it means to outlive death. And the, the, the framing for our resurrection season is um, life after death. It is this framing that we have embraced because for many of us who are attentive to our faith journey, you know, there is a practice of faith, unfortunately, that seeks to uh, make us overly preoccupied with heaven at the expense of earth. And we often can find ourselves in this practice of faith, ignoring all kinds of things that God expects us to attend to while we are here. It also uh, creates lots of dissonance. If we are going through particular challenges on earth, uh, and the best that faith can offer us is to wait to experience heaven when you die. I want you to know that uh, that practice of faith is trying to give me a heart attack. If your pastor just died right up here on this stage from a heart attack, one problem will have been solved. Amen. My God. Broke me out in a sweat. I said, all right, Jesus, I'm getting electrocuted. I hope I've lived right. Amen. Uh I forgot what I was talking about. Yes. Dissonance. Case study in dissonance. Amen. Um, there can be dissonance introduced into the life of a person who takes their faith seriously. If you're expectations don't line up with your circumstances. And every time Easter comes around, <clears throat> um, y'all excuse me, I've been sick all week, so I'm, I'm better now, but I'm just still getting my throat and everything back, but I'm not contagious. I've never tested positive for COVID this week and not so. <laughs> Amen. But it, it, is, it is indeed the case that for we who are faithful and these seasons come around, you know, there's always an effort on multiple levels, history channels, uh, you know, random articles that come on your Facebook or perhaps even the apologists and the hoteps that you may interact with regularly to cause you to question the validity and the value of faith since it does not match the utility or the outcome that faith purports. And I just want to, again, suggest to you all that um, there is nothing wrong with interrogating your faith. Uh, there is nothing wrong with relearning and learning anew and again your faith. Some things that we were given was the best we had. And it is always appropriate to keep learning and reading and studying in ways that reinforce in a charitable manner the value of God's activity in your life the life of your family, your community, and dare I say, the world. Uh, there is always an option to reject faith, but that need not be your only option. 
If you have been raised in a fundamentalist kind of expression of faith where everything is like black and white and right and wrong and it's rigid more than it is flexible, sometimes when things don't line up the way you thought they should, you will throw the baby out with the bathwater. But that need not be your only option. Sometimes it's harder to learn how to be flexible in your faith and live with the questions that your life journey will only answer. Hello, somebody. How many have ever, you know, uh, thought something to be true and you outlive that truth? <laughs> it's like, you know, I, you know, my whole life, I thought there was nine planets. <laughs> Somebody say amen. You live long enough to understand that they don't even count Pluto anymore. They just say Pluto ain't no planet. Just like that, overnight. I said, well, ain't that something? All my life, I no, <laughs> had to fight for Pluto. <laughs> Here it is at 46, threw Pluto away. That is a very rudimentary expression of a truth that if we can be open to new ways of understanding eternal truths, we may find life in unexpected places and outlive the death that is often handed to us through uninterrogated or not all the way thought through theological, political, cultural, ideological assumptions. And it does not mean that all of us are going to end up at the same place in our faith understanding. That's okay. I mean, anyone who will tell you that we all have to believe the same thing is being intellectually dishonest because the church has never at one time all believed the same thing. I don't know that may be a little unnerving for some folk, but you need not overthink it. You are just to drive around Oakland or Berkeley, you see a lot of different churches. Now we believe the same thing about certain things. We believe the same thing about Jesus. We don't believe everybody the same thing about women's role in church. Queer folks, place in church, political candidates, racial things, economic things. And for some, that's very unnerving, but for me, what it teaches me is that God is still working on a lot of us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, the role of justice in the world, in the work of God, is to make sure that while God is working on us, we are treating one another fairly. Hello, somebody. You cannot believe something about somebody else, but you still should treat them fairly. So you may believe, oh, women, you know, they are the they 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 need to be submissive to a man. You can believe that. But you better treat them fairly. Better pay them what you make. <laughs> Keep your hands off their body. Mm -hmm. Speak to them with respect and generosity and affirmation. And some will say, well, that's they can't do that because that's about how they view women. I said, well, that's, that may be true, but they still must be held accountable for how we treat one another. And hopefully in the accountability, it opens up space for us to relearn some things. And that is what John chapter 11 in many ways is about in a particularly grandiose way. I can't read all of it, although I would like to. <sighs> but, but I'm going to give you the cliff note version. Maybe we'll revisit it 
maybe on Easter Sunday. So we'll do part two on Easter Sunday. Maybe. In Jesus' name. Lazarus is the brother of two prominent women mentioned in all of the Gospels, Mary and Martha, significant because... Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four Gospels written by four different folks at four different locations. They all either are sharing their own personal eyewitness testimony or they are sharing the, they are writing down the eyewitness testimony of a disciple of Jesus. And it is significant because when you find the presence of any story in all four of the Gospels, it means that this was considered a very prominent narrative, an oral history that was kept alive even before it was written that. And all of these texts were written, Mark was the first one written, I think about 67 AD, so less than 30 years after the life of Jesus or after Jesus was crucified and died and arose again. Then you had Matthew and then you had Luke and then you had John. That was kind of the thinking of these four gospels written. 30 years after the life of Jesus, and the longest one was like 60 years, right? So you have a whole lifetime of Jesus captured by eyewitnesses before they died. These are the first generation eyewitnesses of Jesus. And Mary and Martha are two women considered to be sisters who were early supporters of Jesus. Now, why is this important? Because in that time, the idea that two women who were not married, most likely they may have been widowed, they were women of means who lived and housed Jesus, meaning that when Jesus came through Bethany, the house, the place they lived, Jesus and his disciples were hosted by Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha arguably were the first supporters of Jesus. Martha is considered in many texts to be the one who was constantly uh, dealing with the arrangements, the, 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 the operations, if you will. Uh, the word used to describe Martha in the Greek would go on to be translated in the English to mean deacon. That Martha was one of the first to be described as a deacon, a leader in the church. In this particular passage, again, I got to give you all the cliff notes because the sisters already preached half of my message today, praise God. But I'll come back on the Easter Sunday and try to figure it all out. But, but in, 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 in the text, you also find that Martha, in this particular text, was one of the first recorded followers of Jesus to declare that Jesus was the Messiah the son of the living God. The other recorded one was Peter. And we often celebrate Peter, you know. Peter, you know, uh, is described as, uh, you know, uh, the rock, that, uh, that confession that, that God will build the church of Jesus Christ on that confession. But also here in this particular passage, you find Martha or Mary, and, you know, I can't take you down that rabbit hole today, but you, you'll find that, that this was the other early proclamation of Jesus being the Messiah. So you have in the story, right, this particular story, an expression of faithfulness at its earliest point in Jesus' ministry held down by women. And I think that's so important as we kind of, you know, uh, culminate the Women's History Month, that women are not in a social journey. That it does not weaken our faith, it does not weaken our society, it does not weaken any of us. There is this sense today, and I'm very aware of it, that, you know, uh, some brothers, men in society feel under attack. Then I saw someone uh, describe it, the emasculation of men, <laughs> because women are emerging and being celebrated. And I often, you know, wonder 
uh, what kind of scarcity mentality have we internalized? Where there's only enough power for some to have influence and agency at the expense of others. Rather than us thinking of it as a zero-sum game, why do we not think of it as a multiplying force? That you can be your most powerful when the person next to you, regardless of their description, are their most powerful. Mm -hmm. All right, and, 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 and so in this passage, I find this story to be a powerful multiplying force in the narrative of Jesus' journey to Calvary and on the other side to resurrection. Because there's something very powerful and interesting about how we outlive death. And I am always reminded of a mentor of mine who told me that there are many ways to kill a person without taking their life. Uh, and, you know, he was an elderly, older black man, you know, after I'd gotten beat up in San Jose by some cops, and he was, along with my pastor, uh, Pastor Dace, they were trying to help me to figure out how to respond to my own abuse, physical, sexual, roughed up, abusive encounter with the police. And he was telling me, you know, what you must do is not allow your circumstance to kill your promise. Because, you know, I was a very, you know, fragile person in many ways at that time. You know, you live your life in a way where you tell yourself you live in your life the right way. And how many of us, you know, there are moments in our life where we know we foul. You know, we out here, you know, ducking and dodging and <laughs> sticking and moving. Then there are other times you're like, I'm doing this thing the right way. Any, any witness in here, you know the difference between the sticking and moving and the right way? And you, you narrate it to yourself, right? I'm doing it right. The man, the pastor told me I did it this way. <laughs> I'm still out here catching hell, right? And, 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 and then, you know, it causes you to start asking yourself, is all of this really worth it? Maybe I should just go back to the other way. It is a threat to your promise, to your hope for a future that you have not yet grasped. This passage is powerful because it puts front and center the failed expectations of two of the earliest followers of Jesus who at great sacrifice to themselves hosted a revolutionary. And I want you to be reminded, Jesus was not somebody who just, you know, was loved by everybody. <laughs> All right. I know we sanitize Jesus, give him a nice perm, give him some soft, soft baby, ba was Johnson baby oil skin, some nice blue eyes with some long lashes that you buy at Walgreens and, you know, a nice, you know, comfortable you know, little thing that you wear around and you kind of look at him and he looks so pleasant and he floating through life without a care and all of a sudden you were such a sinful person that sin snatched up this nice light skin blonde hair blue eyed innocent Jesus and brutally killed him so you could be saved I know that's what we think about it again that could work for some folk but the reality is, most of everywhere Jesus went, people were running him out of town after a little while. Jesus being there dealing with lepers. You can't talk to no leper. Don't you know you talking to a leper puts all of us at risk? Get out of town. You know, okay, well, you know, I'll move on to the next place. We talked about the, the woman at the well last week. Jesus talking to a woman at the even Jesus' own disciples. Like, Jesus, what you doing to holler at a woman at a well? <laughs> We can't leave you nowhere, Jesus. We going to get some food. We coming back. You Mac, it got a whole town. I'm just trying to figure out. Jesus' own disciples couldn't 
keep up with Jesus. There were stories where Jesus would be teaching and he was teaching and it was so disruptive, they tried to run him off a cliff. So this, this ain't just the Jesus who, you know, everybody loved. This is Jesus, listen, two weeks before he's scheduled to be arrested. Think of the case Jesus had been built up against him. Think of all the witnesses that the Sanhedrin and the Roman soldiers, the government had spies, COINTELPRO, building cases on Jesus. Oh, I'm going to put a case on you. King Kong ain't got nothing on you. know what I mean? Jesus is a scandalous person right about this time. And who is hosting Jesus? Two women never mentions a man in this text so that means that they likely are quite vulnerable in the social setting of their day are hosting a renegade criminal named Jesus I want you to understand that Jesus surely knew how to pick them these had to be some bad sisters if, if I were rewriting this story in my own imagination, I'm sure they was packing. I'm sure these sisters was like, folk didn't want to come by their house. So like, you better leave Mary and Martha alone. <laughs> Them sisters, they got bandits at their house. They got folk coming in and out their house. They want to run from the law. They don't need no security. They got a big old compound. <laughs> it's just me reimagining in my own Holy God, I'm trying to help him make sense. Jesus was not someone who was not without offense. And these women had been risking a lot for the last few years to host Jesus. And their little brother named Lazarus has died. They sent word to Jesus, yo, Jesus, our brother is dying Hurry up and get here because we watched you raise a, uh, uh, another little girl that you didn't even know from the dead. We watched you heal this paralyzed person. You didn't know them from, from, from their paralysis. We watched you heal this, this, this woman with the issue of blood. So surely, Jesus, you're going to get here in time to help our brother who you sat at the table with from dying. They send word, the scripture, if you were to read it. Jesus gets word, and Jesus says, okay, well, I'm going to wait a little while because, you know, I got other things to do, and we'll get there later. By the time they arrive, Lazarus is dead, and this is where the scripture gets very interesting. How can you outlive death? I want you to think about it. Not just the physical death. Because one of the great promises of we who are Christians is that we will outlive even physical death. But we'll save that for resurrection, but just, 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 just remind yourself that death don't have the final say in the life of the follower of Jesus. I mean, this was the earliest confession that caused Christian faith to go rampant throughout the early, early world. That death was not feared by the early church because they thought that they were going to be resurrected. And for thousands of years, we've all held that same confession. So we'll talk about that on Sunday, two Sundays from now or two weeks from now. But what I do find fascinating is death of expectations, death of disappointments, deaths of relationships, deaths of opportunities, failed expectations can create death and loss in our lives. How do you outlive that? First thing I'm going to say in this text, I need some water because my voice is struggling. First thing that the scripture reminds us is that your disappointment with God does not negate your confession of faith in God. Everybody repeat after me, my disappointment does not negate my confession. That, that's, that's new water. 
Come on, thank God for the mother of the church. Amen. We still got, we got 21st century mothers of the church. Disappointment with God does not negate your confession. In this passage, you'll find something very powerful, right? That in verse number 21, Martha runs to Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. One of the first ways that you and I will learn to outlive death is to confront head on your disappointments with God. Confront head on your disappointments with God. Faith dies when you can't complain to God. Because when you don't feel like you can tell God your truth, you will stop talking to God about your truth. And then you will start to harbor resentments. Hello, somebody. Mary and Martha, two of the most committed followers of Jesus, the scripture says in various different parts of this passage, Martha first runs to meet Jesus. She didn't run to meet Jesus to celebrate him being there. She runs to meet Jesus to say, why are you late? My brother would have lived if you got here. Mary later on in the passage runs to meet Jesus and says the same thing. Jesus, where you been? When these folks came sniffing around here asking where you were at, trying to build a case on you, we didn't, you know, drop a dime. Well, Jesus just left here, you know, on his way to Samaria to go holler at the woman by the well. Their disappointment with God was something they were willing to run to Jesus to share. And I want you to appreciate that the only way you outlive death, disappointment, those moments of loss in your life is to confront your disappointments with God by running to God in prayer and meditation and inquiry and lay them at the feet of God. God is not threatened by your disappointments. God is not so fragile that God can't hear something from his children that is not hallelujah. Who wanna, I, I just want you to understand that some of this again is our projection of what we think we can take. And so we believe, well, you know, since many of us can't take a whole lot of criticism without falling to pieces, I'm, I'm one of these folk. Man, I have a threshold. <laughs> I can take one or two, but you getting a three and four and five, I'm like, all right now, I'm human just like you. Where were the grace at? I mean, no, God is not threatened by your disappointments. As a matter of fact, your disappointments are an opportunity for you to get more information from God about what God is doing and what God is not doing. And what we are being asked to do. And what God is going to do in and through us. So my first inquiry for you today is, how are your disappointments or unmet expectations from God concerning to you? And have you ran to Jesus yet, like Mary and Martha, and laid these at Jesus' feet? Or are you holding on to them? And again, I want to just say that for many of us, and I was raised in a church uh, like this with you know, no no uh, criticism, right? That, you know, you don't question God. 
God is sovereign. Whatever God do, you just got to swallow it. Well, that's true, but it don't mean you can't ask God some questions. I mean, you know, I want you to know, in a sense, you got to swallow it. It means that, you know, life happens, and you're not going to be able to do much with life when it happens, except for just keep on living. But can you imagine that some things you don't have to carry through your process of living? The God, you let me down. So, God, I got to talk to you about this here thing because I feel let down. You told me to pray, I pray. <laughs> Nothing happened. You told me to give, I gave. You told me to forgive, I forgave. And I'm still disappointed. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your problems. Make sure you run to Jesus with your disappointment. Second thing, how do you outlive death? You Make space for grief. Process of grief. This could be a message all by itself, but again, I don't have time. But I'm going to give you five stages of grief that I learned about in my therapy trainings. And you can kind of just ask yourself, have you gone through a process of grief as you've lost things? COVID-19, I was meeting with our, the new mayor of Oakland, me and Pastor Jackie Thompson this past week. We're, you know, asking our advice about some things. And I said this in, in another meeting uh, at the White House, said it with some pastors. I said, isn't it interesting that we have not had in this country a day of grieving and remembrance since COVID-19 has happened? They're removing the mandates around masking. I would encourage you to wear masks as much as you can when you're in certain places, especially when you're flying and, you know, you should be wearing masks here if you, if you need to. I just want you to know we got a high tech. We upgraded our sound, our not sound, what is this, our ventilation system and we got monitors in here. So, you know, I think our air is recycling pretty good. So we're not a super spreader event place, praise God. It costs us $10,000 to do it. We did it early in COVID, but we want to be a safe place. But isn't it interesting that literally the United States has lost well over a million loved ones? 24 months, just to COVID, not one day of grief, one day of remembrance, one day of mourning. Folk been fussing ever since they asked you to stay inside. When can I come back outside? Asked you to stay home from work. When can I go back to work? Ask you to keep your kids home to keep them safe. Where can I send my... And then folk been arguing ever since. You hear what I'm telling you? Oh, we got to hurry up and get back to normal. There is no more normal. We are living now in an age of COVID. And when COVID is over, guess what it will be? Post-COVID. There is no more pre-COVID living. I'll give you another great example. 9-11. How many of you remembered what it was like to fly on planes before 9-11. Anybody? Some of you young people don't even know what we're talking about. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> there was a time, <laughs> I want you to hear me, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, where you could get to the airport and just walk. <laughs> I'm talking walking, your family, your, 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 your friends, your kids, just walk right on up to the gate. And they be hugging you, oh, don't leave. I'm so sorry, I don't want you to leave. You walking in with chicken. You walking in with drinks. You, 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 there was no. Anybody remember pre-9-11 travel? Some of y'all forgot. You're like, oh, I guess that was true. Not no more. You can't eat. Man, you got to hug your loved one when you drop them off. On the curb, they won't even let you stop half the time. Just slow down and push. <laughs> Hope you make your flight. Well, I don't want to get a ticket. <laughs> I'm here to tell you what I know to be true. That's what post-COVID is is. It's a new reality. When are you going to take time to grieve for all the loss of COVID? 
in your life. That's just COVID. Some of us have lost relationships. Some of us have lost loved ones to violence. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have lost opportunities. Some of us have lost all kinds of things. And we just, American way, we, we got to get back to normal. No, you don't got, there is no more. You got to learn to slow down and allow space for grief so you can outlive death. Five ways. First way is denial. Talking about a stage of grief. You got to go through. Often the first stage is denial. Can't believe this happened. Oh, this ain't, I can't, no, I can't believe it. You in shock. Do you not know shock is a physiological response to trauma in your body? When you in shock, your body is saying, I can't take all of this right now, so I'm going to put up a wall. So I, talking about the body, trying to survive. The body will help you survive if you let it. Too much shock. And you sit there till you can receive the fullness of what has happened. Second stage is anger. After shock, you like upset. Can you believe this done happened? First step is, I can't believe it. Second step is, can you believe? Anybody been through those two stages? Amen. We're just keeping it real. Some of us may be living in one of them stages now. Third step is bargaining. What am I going to do? What is this? What, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? Who's going to help me? Fourth stage is depression. And reality sits in. Man, this sucks. The fifth stage is acceptance. All right. This is real. You can't skip grief and expect to outlive death. If you skip grief, you will be trapped in death. How can we who are resurrected people afford to be trapped in death? It is not God's intent for you and I to be trapped in dead places. It's hard. I want you to understand. I'm not telling you nothing is easy. It's hard. But there is a path through it. And again, in this passage, you find Jesus. That's why I like this passage so much. Jesus enters the grief with them. <laughs> uh, that kind of blows up the whole, you know. If you have faith, you, you just going, you know, God ain't going, you know, sit with you and just rejoice. Oh, if Jesus can weep and grieve with his earliest of followers, Jesus can sit with you and I and go through all five stages with us. The question is, are we willing to sit with Jesus in our grief? Or are we just running, trying to get back to normal? No, there ain't no more normal. You got to learn how to adjust to a new normal. People that I've lost to death, to tragedies, to circumstances, it's a new normal. It's hard, but it always, always finds a way to get to a new place where life can begin again. And that's the last thing. How do you outlive death? Stay open to a divine surprise. Jesus sits in them with their grief, and then Jesus finally at the end, I love this verse. Let me make sure I say it right. Cries out with a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. 
All of a sudden, Scripture says the dead man came out. A dead man came out. They didn't say an alive person came out. A dead man. In this story, Jesus cries out with a loud voice and offers a divine surprise to the people he sat with in their grief. I'm, I'm wrapping up because Lord knows I done went on and on and on. I'm sorry. Martha says to Jesus, if you've been here, Lazarus would not have died. Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe on me, as the scripture says, not only will he live, but you will live again. Martha's response, and this is deep. Martha's response is, I know that you are, I know that Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, Martha, give you a little quick background, is referring to her own theological understanding as a Jewish woman. Most Jews believe that all who die will be resurrected in the end. Jesus questions Martha's faith. Martha responds not with no faith, but with the best faith she has. I want you to this is going back to you interrogating your faith. Martha gives Jesus back the best faith she has. Jesus says to her, you talking about the last day, but I'm talking about today. Martha did not have the faith for resurrection today. She had the faith for the last day. Jesus knows how to take whatever faith you have and build upon it to revolutionize the faith for your today. Just come with whatever faith you have. Oh, I don't believe in all that crazy stuff. Come with whatever faith you have. Oh, my grandmama knew said that. Well, that's, that's a good start. I'm new to this thing. I don't believe all this stuff. Nobody should believe all of it. Just believe what you can. But keep coming back to Jesus. Coming back to God. I know folks disappoint you, but keep coming back to God. I know God has let you down. Keep coming back to God. I know you can't make sense of a lot of this, but keep coming back to God. Because whatever you have in your hand is faith. God knows how to take that little bit of faith or a lot of bit of faith and build upon it for the faith you need today. And every time God builds on your faith, listen to this, you will experience a divine surprise. I need Jesus to cry out with a loud voice in my situations. <laughs> I need Jesus to show up later on time. I prefer on time, but if you gotta be late, just please still come. You sing a song, may not come when you want them, but he's what? So just keep coming. Just come, Jesus. I prefer you get here, you know, before all hell break loose. But if you get here after it, <laughs> all right. And when you get here, give me space to be upset, disappointed, and let down. You got that. And then Jesus cry out with a loud voice in my situation. Cry out. I, I mean... It must have been something. You know, the old school black church preachers, they used to say it like this. Jesus had to call Lazarus by name. <laughs> they said if Jesus just would have said, come out, every single dead person. Then, <laughs> well, dad, talk about, I see dead people everywhere just walking around here. Stand to your feet, everybody. Let's prepare to ask God to help us in some time of prayer. I think I got reflection questions on here for all these things. So feel free to take a picture of that. Use it in your own free time. Huh. 
I do believe that we can outlive death in all of its manifestations. I do believe that we don't have to be defined by loss, nor do we have to ignore it in order to get through it. But God leads us from a path of death to life on a regular cyclical basis. Not everything that will happen in your life will happen according to your plan or your expectation. There will be moments where you will feel let down by God. There will be moments where unexpected tragedies, global pandemics, shootings, abuse, layoffs, illness, financial hardships, they all will visit us and they will visit us indiscriminately, sometimes at the same time, sometimes staggered. But I want you to know that there is life bubbling even among the death situations we encounter. I pray that you'll find God in the midst of all of your circumstances and your trials. And the first way we find God is in community. So make contact or proximity with the person next to you if you don't mind. Touch their shoulder, elbow, hand. I know some of us, we touch phobic, phobic. We don't want folk all up on us and stuff, but I'm just invite you just to imagine that there's something precious about being proximal to God's people in a season where isolation has become so normative for so many of us we gather together as God's people because we believe together God can do something much more significant than if we were isolated so God I pray for my loved one who I am touching I pray, God, that you will multiply our impact in faith, in prayer, in healing, in courage, in hope. I pray, God, that by faith, our connection to one another, whether we know one another very deeply or not, by faith, I pray that being connected to your church to the body of Christ has an exponential impact in my spirit and in my soul and in my heart and in my mind. That just like Mary and Martha and Lazarus were friends of yours, God, it is your will for me and us to be friends, for us to be in relationship with one another, for us to learn how we belong to each other and our embracing of one another beyond our differences there's something special about what we hold alike and that is our love for you and your love for us I pray that you'll heal my loved one who I'm touching I pray that you'll give strength to them I pray that their disappointments that are either at the surface or deeply deeply buried I pray God that you will handle their disappointments and their letdowns the tears that flow from being rejected by those who should love them the pain that emanates from the misuse by those who should care for them the 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 letdown of doing their best and still finding systems punishing them unjustly I pray God that those circumstances will not kill their faith but I pray God that you will sit with them in their grief and provide God concrete manifestations of surprises and we'll say thank you God because if you're doing it for them I know you'll do it for me now lift your hands right where you're standing it's me oh lord and i stand in the need of prayer it is not my mother it is not my father it is not my sister or my brother but it's me oh lord and i need you somebody say i need you lord 
I need your love. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your healing. I need your anointing. I need you, God, to do something in me that cannot be done by anybody else. I pray, God, that you will rebuke the enemy that is scheming in my life. I pray that you will cancel, God, the depression and the self-harm and the suicide ideation. I pray, God, that you will inject life and hope that comes from your spirit. As I work through the cycles of grief, I pray, God, that you will inject people and, and practices, God, that can help coach me and lead me back to a place of life that is worth the living because you are alive in us. I say thank you for salvation. Somebody say thank you for salvation. I say thank you for healing. Somebody say thank you for healing. I say thank you for hope. Somebody say thank you for hope. I say thank you for new life. Somebody say thank you for new life. And we love you God because you are alive in us and we will bless you in Jesus name we pray come on and let's give God a hand praise everybody